Welcome to The Growth Show with Matt Lindsay, where we discuss growth strategies both for business and a personal perspective. Hi, good afternoon and welcome to The Growth Show. Today's guest is Anthony Villis, who's the Managing Director of First Wealth, a wealth management company. How are you doing, Anthony? You well? I'm very well, Matt. Thank you very much. All is all is good. Thank you. Good. Well, pleasure to have you on. Um, and what I what I like to do when with my guests initially is just run through how we how we met and first interacted. And I was trying to think back on that, and it's probably about 2012 that we first met. And I probably rocked up to your offices and pitched some investments to you at that time with maybe with a colleague. I think. Yeah, probably right. Yeah, we were. That was the Marleybone office. The uh... In the muse now, yeah, we we just moved in there, so it's like, yes, you say 10, 10, 10 years ago, time flies. Yeah, and do you know what? I think that's probably the last time I saw you as well. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fine. Yeah, once every ten years, probably enough to be honest. You don't want to see me more than that. <laughs> um, however, we've stayed in stayed in contact via social media, and I've been really impressed with the way that you've grown your business over the years. And I know that you've you've undertaken a number of kind of personal challenges as well during that during that period of time. Um, so yeah, I think it's I, I, the purpose of the growth show. If for those who haven't haven't heard heard of this before, is to provide kind of inspiration and ideas for people who are thinking about starting their own company and you know we discuss some of the trials and tribulations and challenges that come with running companies um for, and 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 we go we go through it from there so hopefully that's what you're expecting um but Anthony over to you if you could provide us with a bit of narrative around your career and how you ended up where you've got to that would be most appreciated yeah no perfect no problem so yeah i mean Quick recap. So I started when I was 21 at Chase Devere, absolutely clueless guy, sort of came straight out of university, quickly learned how to get into financial, well, I guess financial planning then, uh, which was less about technical, much more about selling back in the back in the day. Um, did 10 years there, had an amazing time, met some brilliant friends who I'm still in contact with. Uh, decided to go traveling. We got some earn out from Bank of Ireland, purchase of Chase Devere, um, took eight, 18 months off, traveled the world, which was incredible. Um, kind of vowed that I'd never go back into financial services, um, but needed to get a job because uh, I'd run out of money. And uh, so I took a job working, setting up a financial planning firm in an accountancy practice in London, um, where the guy that ran that business, let's just say we didn't get on. Um, that's that's a mild version of it. So I did two years there, um, realized I couldn't stand him anymore and left and talked to my old mate Rob Kaplan from Chase Devere and said look it's the financial crisis everything's falling apart why don't we set up a financial planning business that would be that would be a laugh um, and we did that so we set that up in 2009 um, just as everything was sort of falling apart and really you know after the crisis and that was you know whatever that is 13 years ago so we built First Wealth now we've got like 23 24 people um, we're a certified B Corp, which is great. So looking at how we our impact on the world rather than just making money. And now recently we've set up a couple of new businesses, one called Open Advice, which is a software business, which is designed to close the advice gap, help financial planners talk to the next generation of clients through a, a sort of a, a system that is more efficient and just less disjointed than most technology that's out there at the moment. So that's, that's sort of um, being built as we, how it has been built. Um, and we've also got another business, which is uh, Thrive Money, which is a financial education business um, and really designed to say First Wealth is very much a high net worth entrepreneurial type client base. But what are the things we've learned as financial planners over the last, you know, 25 years of doing it? And can we give some of that to next generation of clients? You know, how do they get started? What's 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 good money practice and what's bad money practice? And just trying to use our influence to say, you know, some of the nonsense you see on Instagram about crypto and get rich quick schemes is actually trying to tell the truth about money um, rather than people sort of getting involved in things that they shouldn't do and losing money so they're the sort of the various things we're we're up to at the moment interesting so how do you have any time <laughs> um i got um i got a good group of people uh in the business you know so we've got great great people in first wealth which is which is great so most of the stuff i mean i'm lucky that most of my clients now are looked after by the team more generally so i still get involved occasionally and i've still got those relationships with some of the clients that might ask me but most of the day-to-day -day financial planning i'm not involved with um now 
but much more around yeah focus on strategy and people you know managing people and making sure everyone's aligned and everyone's happy with what they're doing um rob does a lot of the um so really rob and i split our time i do most of the open advice stuff he does most of the thrive money stuff and then we sort of built the two together a little bit um we're launching the thrive money foundation course which is going to be a paid for course in january um and what people are doing go on to the course that we've built um look at the videos around the, the pillars of uh, financial planning and then what we we've given them an access to our open advice platform so they can almost use the tools to do their own financial planning to some extent to say here's a fact find get yourself organized here's a open banking integration to see where you're spending your money here's some stuff around risk and behavioral stuff and how does that impact you so we're 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 using those tools to give back on to, to the people on the course. And it's been really good from a beta testing perspective for us to see what we're doing well and see which bits we, we, we can improve. So, yeah, I think sometimes Matt, you know what it's like, sometimes it's like, I can't deal with this. It's too much, but most of the time it's, it's, it's cool. It's, 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 you know, we're, we enjoy what we do and we're passionate about trying to make a difference. So it's, we will find time to, to make it all work. And, and when you started first wealth, so all, all those, all those years ago, that must have been quite a kind of scary moment, you know, jumping in with both feet. How, how did you feel at that time? And how did you kind of combat that nervousness that, you know, you naturally would have about launching launching your kind of first venture, if we put it that way? Yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, so two things about that. The first one is the guy I used to work for was so unbearable that doing anything other than working for him was was brilliant. You know, so I would have been swimming the swimming across the North Pole naked would have felt like a joy compared to, to going to see him. Um, so that made it easier. Um, I think then we also were quite good about taking some time. So I had to be probably a year when Rob and I were talking about this. And we were, so rather than just like I've resigned, I'm, I'm doing this. What do we do next? It's like, right, how are we going to make this work? Rob has a Rob was working for his dad. Uh, um, they were a mortgage business, so he had some planning clients. Um, I thought I could probably take some clients who would follow me from where I was. So we like right, if we can get these clients across into the new business in the first twelve months or so, we've probably got enough to get away to pay ourselves, you know, a small salary and get us started. Um, so it was almost, it, it, you know, it's weird looking back. I I don't. I just say there, there were no, there was no other choice. We, I couldn't stand, I couldn't do, I couldn't continue to do what I was doing anymore. And it was just, it got, you know, what happened, you know, the financial, it was all so bad. It's like, well, we may as well have a go now. Cause if we can make it work now, then it should all be relatively straightforward from, from, from now on, from there on. And, you know, it, it, the business moves and changes and the, 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 the sort of, um, you know, the challenges you have are different, but I do think launching it then was, was a really, good thing to do because it's like everything everything is relative so even when we had covid it's like well it's obviously not ideal from a you know perspective from a financial perspective obviously then there's a wider part here about sort of health and people losing their lives but and that never felt anywhere near as bad as the financial crisis purely from a, an economic financial perspective this is a problem 2008 the world the financial world is on the verge of collapse it never felt like that coach so it gives you a bit of wisdom and a bit of something to almost like a comfort blanket sometimes to look back on and go yeah this is all right we'll you know we'll get through it we just need to communicate with the clients and maybe to communicate with some of the team who hadn't been through 2008 so it's it, it there's a lot of good that comes out of launching in such a such a challenging time and so there must be parallels between 2008 and kind of where we are now, right? With inflation at all-time highs or, or recent years' highs, um, combined with yeah, lots of particularly in the UK, lots of spending pressures and um, energy cost rising, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you think? I, I appreciate the the banks have retained liquidity this time around for the time being. Um, yeah. That obviously may change, but hopefully not. Um, do you see any similarities between then and then and now? I don't know whether I'm just sort of sort of an old cynic, really, but I, I sort of think that I just think the last 14, 15 years, not not much is a, a lot has happened, but not a lot has happened. It, it always feels like there's 
since the financial crisis, I don't think we've ever really recovered from it. Let's put it, let's put it that way. I think sure. because we've had cheap money, we've seen asset prices go through the roof. We've seen you know, house prices go up massively. We've seen equity prices go up. So it's almost, I think, disguised some of the wider issues we have. So we had 2008, then we had the, you know, the euro debt crisis. We had the Greek crisis. We've had Brexit. We had COVID. It's just like, wow, one, one, one after another. So asset prices have gone up. Um, but has wealth distribution equaled out in this country? It's just got worse and worse. I think mm. financial, the financial crisis caused a problem for people on lower incomes that ne they've never recovered from. Um, and because we've had no growth, the distribution of wealth has been sh shameful, really. Let's put it that way. The, the cutting of public services has been shameful as well. I think this is played out over 13 or 14 years this is not a this is something new that we've got to worry about because of covid this started in the financial crisis and things have just drifted um and now maybe all of that's coming home to roost a little bit but this is not a this is not a current crisis this is the last 14 15 years as far as i'm concerned yeah i agree and i think you know if you're gonna gonna pump in i think they've doubled the amount of pounds in circulation in a very it's, short, it's short period of yeah. time that's yeah. going to have an impact right you can't expect to do that and not not have things change somewhat it's just interesting how that compares to the us dollar which seems to be the currency of strength at the moment whilst the pound's taking a bath really that's a bit of a shame to see but yeah, it is. It's, uh, well, you know, we won't get into the conversation around Brexit. People will, you know, it's, you know, what is, what is, what is, what's, what's caused our problems? I mean, we have a, we have a productivity issue, but then that's not dissimilar to the rest of the world, really. So, sure. um, yeah, we have a lot of debt. We have, um, we have commitments to spend. Um, and I just don't think we're, we're struggling to, we're struggling to balance the books. That's the reality. So what do you do? The only way out of this is, is long-term growth. I mean, you, you can do two things, can't you? If you're in trouble financially, you can either try to slim your expenditure, which is one way of doing it, which has got a part to play. But the only long-term solution is to grow your income. That's the only way. It's the same within conversations we have at First Wealth is to say, if we need more people to do the job, um, and we're struggling with cash flow, then I can make people redundant. We're not, we're not going to do that. The only, therefore, the only thing we can do is to get out there and to find more clients and make sure that we are retaining those clients and we're winning new, new, new business. That's, that's mm. how to do it. Um, mm. So, and, but creating additional productivity and income from the UK economy is it's about putting money into education. It's into going into infrastructure. These are long-term plays that, and green energy, you can't just fix this stuff overnight. This The problem is we've got a hangover from now, the lack of investment over the last 20 years, 30 years, that can't just be solved. Doesn't matter what levers you play. And the only lever you can play now is to say, stop spending so much money because you can't just generate income because we've lacked that investment. So that's the that's the challenge the government's got. Um, that won't be the same, whether it's a Tory government, a Labour government. And it's why ultimately a lot of these decisions about long-term spend need to be taken out of the hands of government and politicians where they're looking at a five-year window it just doesn't work mm, no i agree it's a it's a tricky one um so so in terms of these new businesses then so you yes. you've, you've established you've well, you've got a well-established financial planning firm and i note on your linkedin profile you were chartered financial planning firm of the year for 21 22 from the personal finance society so congratulations right. on that award yeah no that was great that was a, one of the highlights we we we'd come i think we would come in the top of three i think that was our fourth time and I sort of was getting to stages like maybe we're never going to win this thing. So yeah, we got it now last last November. Um, yeah, so it was a great a great a great result for First Wealth. So it was really really good to sort of celebrate all the hard work that everyone's made to get us to this stage. And and are those awards kind of signifying you know a, a kind of a trend that's been implemented into your business to kind of grow it and increase it whilst maintaining, you know, the quality that was implemented between yourself and Robert, or is that, is that, you know, something new that's come, come to come yeah, to the it's, floor? It's a really good question. So I think when we, when we were getting going, we applied for all the awards, um, you know, tried to get into as many as possible. And we won, you know, we won quite a lot. We had a great year, I think 2015, where we redid, the way we were doing business, we were put a much more client-centric life planning piece in there. So, you know, we would, rather than doing the, what's your money, you know, what pension have you got, that very much finance conversation, much more around, what's the purpose of this? What's your vision? You know, what's your aspirations? What are the your values? We, we pivoted the business to 
to to have those conversations much more coaching sort of around 2015 and part of that was because rob and i were just going stir crazy because the next person that asked us about what they thought was going to happen to the euro i think my head was going to explode it's like I, I really don't know let's get the older let's get the magic you know the, the the crystal ball out but we you know it was all that guesswork that for years financial planners are like right buy this fund do this and because that's going to, and there's no value in any of that so we kind of knew that so it's like right we've got to change the way we do business to say markets are doing their thing over here that's out there the bit we can control is the client and their action and their financial plan we can do stuff about that the markets mm. will then go outside so change the business um and yeah had some brilliant engagement with clients really got our energy up uh, rebranded the business um and then we won three or four big awards that year and that was that was a sort of that almost felt like the start of what we almost first world two really almost starting it again um but yeah so we don't do so many awards we don't apply i mean i just got a little bit fixated about trying to win the chartered financial planning firm of the year so i write this is i write it's the first name on the score sheet is i write what are you going to do this year? Right. I am going to see if we can win the financial planning firm of the year award. And that just was on there for about five or six years. So it was good to finally get that ticked off. Um, and then we can, so I can relax now, but we, you know, we do apply for a few, but it's, it, I think that was the, for us, it was probably the big, the, the big one. And the financial service sector, right? For, so for me, I think it's an interesting one because clearly you've got a lot of wealth managers, IFAs retiring. You've yep. got a lot of consolidation in the sector with, you know, SJP hoovering up whatever they can and then, you know, a number of other parties backed by private equity or otherwise in in, yep. in the marketplace. If, you know, I think it's, it's a sector that I've always, you know, worked alongside, as you know, selling investments into it. And, you know, I've done some of the exams over the years. If If you were, you know, 20, 20 odd years old, at the beginning again is it is it a sector that you would start in now do you think or would you avoid it oh no i think it's 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 infinitely better than when it when i started when i was 20. i mm. you know i i think then it was if you can sell yourself um and you have a little bit of technical knowledge then that's then you can be a good financial planner mm. um i think post rdr it almost went the other way so everyone was doing all these exams and people forgot that actually it is a it is a a profession where people want to engage with people you have to have a bit of something about it. you have to have the ability to have a conversation with a client or ask them some mm -hmm. questions and be able to listen to what they're saying to you um so i think now hopefully we're going back to a better balance where we say you've got to be technically astute. Um, you've got to understand about finance and economics and sort of psychology. There's a lot of stuff going on here, uh, maybe mm. some coaching, cognitive biases, all that sort of stuff. Um, but you still have to show up and you've still got to find clients and you've still got to be able to engage and talk to those clients. So I think it's it's quite a, it's quite a, it's a difficult job because not everyone's got the ability to have the technical aspect plus the ability to interact with clients but i think now we are in a profession where you can have one or the other and still be a really good financial planner so yeah i mean i you know i've got a young daughter she's seven um when i started when i was 25 she'd said then before she was born would you would you want your lux daughter to lux my daughter to go into it i was like <laughs> no chance um well now she came to me and said dad i want to be a financial planner i'd probably be quite shocked but um i wouldn't i wouldn't try to dissuade her from doing it. i think uh i think if you go in with the right intentions of helping people you can actually build a fantastic career in financial planning and it's it's not just about the heavy sales it used to be it's about helping people and i think that's a that's a massively rewarding thing to be doing absolutely and i i suppose as well you probably find some inspiration and stimulation from dealing with some of the entrepreneurs and clients that you you come across as well that must be quite interesting it is really interesting and i think that's 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 a really good question i think one of the things that you can now do is now the businesses have grown that those conversations are much more what i would call on a level so it's kind of like well you've got a really successful business you know we've got first wealth that's quite successful these are the things that i'm going on in my life what do you think and it's like actually i've got the same so you can have a really good conversation with a client and no we to be honest we use that as a usp to say that you can go and engage with the private bank and all that which is fine but you're going to be dealing with an employee they won't ever be able to have the empathy or the skill set to understand what it's like to employ a team of people or how does it feel to meet payroll every month or 
you know if you've got a, uh, got an issue with a couple of your team members like how do you how do you deal with that sort of stuff and what does it feel like about how do you apply your budget every year getting a balance between looking after your team and making sure your cash flows all right all these things that anyone running a business has to do i think it's really easy that sort of empathy of yep we're in the same boat here but we're just a financial planner doing that and you're a you know whatever you're doing a sort of manufacturing or art or marketing whatever it is it mm. doesn't really matter those issues are the same so it really does help us with with that engagement with clients yeah no interesting and and so then to 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 move on to the the new ventures if if we will so open advice thrive money um yeah obviously in the industry you know speaking as a kind of inverted commas insider there's been a lot of um, you know, kind of robo advice attempts. Yeah. I don't yeah. think anyone's really cracked it just yet, have they? There's there's been some things that are, are doing okay. Um, yeah. What what what? So clearly, you're then seeing a different type of opportunity and something that's more akin to a kind of traditional kind of entrepreneurial journey with maybe some software thrown in there, building kind of platforms. How does that come about? Well. A lot of it just came about through sort of frustration of why doesn't this exist? Because it's clearly something that's required. So the problem with robo advice is it isn't advice. It's just robo investment. It's kind of like come on the platform, fill out a risk profile. Here's a portfolio. Do you want to invest your money? Which is mm. fine. But that's not advice. That's that's just here's a portfolio. Mm. So can you build something that, automates actual advice that says right you're coming on the platform um this is your life expectancy this is what you when you're going to need to think about retirement this is how much you need to retire on based on what you're spending you need to save this this is what you've got at the moment model that forward automated this is what you need by the way we think you should have this amount of insurance at the moment you haven't got it there's a gap here do you want to do that um so to try to give some clients some visibility of what their financial planning long term looks like rather than just a portfolio now for some of those clients, a portfolio is going to be a right outcome. So, for example, if they're saying, oh, I want to save to retirement, that's my goal, then, you know, to put money into a pension is the, the right thing to do. But it's not, you know, what is it about if I, I've just had a new child and I want to get some life cover? You know, that's not covered by any of the robo-advisors. Um, or I want to build an emergency fund. Or I want to consolidate some debts. Or actually, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I don't understand finance. I'd like to upskill myself about some of the stuff. None of that mm. exists really at the moment. I think there are a few things that are trying to do it. But if you look at the big incumbents, you know, Nutmeg, Money Farm, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, slightly different, but a lot of their direct-to-consumer stuff is it's all about investments, which again is fine. That's for a lot of clients who are DIY investors. That's exactly what they're looking for. But I just feel like maybe some clients want more than that. They want to have some planning. Um, maybe they can't afford to access a financial planner at the moment because financial planning is expensive. But for me, it's like, when you look at what goes on in our world, financial planners are just turning clients away. The clients are coming to say, I want to talk to you. However, right, in order to engage the fees are X because of the compliance and the sort of full fat service we go through. Is there mm -hmm. a way of saying, look, I can give you access to a, a desktop app or, or, or a mobile phone app that says onboard yourself that'll give you some basics all our portfolios are on there so you can invest alongside our clients but if there's more to what you're looking for if you're looking for some guidance or some education um or how to build a you know your get your life cover right or your income protection right so you can then you know the advisors can white level white label that product and say i will build a relationship i know it's a digital relationship but at least at least i can give you something so that mm. then you can target content to say well actually I'm, i know you're interested in retirement planning so here's a couple of articles we've written about how to do retirement place you start to build a relationship with the next generation of clients um and at the minute i'm not sure i know anything that exists to do that um and you get to the stage where financial advisors are saying go and invest with hargreaves lansdowne which is weird i mean it's it's you know, nothing wrong with algories i like them i think they're a great business but it's weird that you'd be turning away potential clients because the problem is once they've gone they're probably not going to come back so you've blown it um and i just think advisors want to be owning those relationships they just need a way of of helping them to have those conversations 
Yeah, I agree. I think I think that that was one of the kind of negatives of the uh, the retail distribution review, which was some legislation which restricted the way that advisor or change sorry changed the way that advisor char advisors charge, um, yeah. and what it has meant is obviously that the it's made it probably more expensive from an entry perspective. Um, Correct. So so therefore, there's some people that fall into what is known in the industry as the advice gap. That that's probably fair yeah. to say, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's exactly right. And I think I think the FCA are belatedly coming to the advice gap party going for years. They've denied it. They've been in self-denial. The advice doesn't gap doesn't exist. It's like, well, it does. Um, and I think they've gradually worked out over the last couple of years that there is a problem that was created mm -hmm. through RDR. And they are now making noises about, you know, maybe lighter touch advice guided advice which is positive right because something needs to change it's it's absolutely bonkers that a client can come to me and say that and i want to invest 10 grand and i have to you know write war and peace we have to go through this pain pain process that's so painful the same pain process that you know everyone goes through but if it's light touch well what do you, you know here's your situation right have you got any debt no good okay you want to invest ten thousand pounds right the answer is an isa what risk do you want to take? Well, how long do you want to invest it for? Right. That's what you need to do. That's a product outcome. Um, it shouldn't be that difficult. And a financial advisor should be able to make that happen without having to go through such a, a burdensome process of onboarding and, and cost. So hopefully the regulation will evolve in a way that we can help more people. But I think the bit that is clear is that not everything should be about products and never, not everything is about products. You know, there, a lot of people need advice on, again, again, debt consolidation is a good example. I've got five credit cards that are costing me 25% APR. Well, mm -hmm. is there anything I can do? Well, yes, there is stuff you can do. Um, I've got, you know, I, I, I'm worried about, I don't feel like I've got the right level of protection because I've got to say a new kid or whatever it is on getting married, whatever those things are. What, what can you, how can you help me? So I think that's where, the whole piece around what we're doing with Thrive, the financial education, plus the software, if we can bring those together, the whole idea for Rob and I is to say, can we help just give access to financial advice? And we know we're, we're trying to build open advice as a business, but you know, we're not just building it for first wealth. We're saying that here's it, you know, we will have it as a subscription. If someone, anyone else wants to use the software, we'll have it as a SaaS model because we understand that there's a wider problem that needs to be solved here. And really what we need to do is to give the kit to other financial planners so they can then distribute it to their next generation of clients. So it's a, it's a compounding effect of ho hopefully helping hundreds of thousands of people. Interesting. And, and do you think that that will lead up the line to like full advice as well in the future? Obviously we've got AI and machine learning and all of this technology that probably isn't being in, in, implemented in you know the kind of formal advice bit for the for the high net worth clients do you think yeah. that that will feed upwards as well eventually yeah it should do i mean i think what you can do is if you have you know if you have a feeder so you say right i've got uh, as a financial planning plan, i've got a thousand clients on my my sort of technology sort of robo advice platform where they're getting a bit of light touch some of them might be self-service some of them might be Let's do an annual review hybrid advice 30 minutes once a year as a sort of different tier. Um, some of those clients are going to get more complex. Their financial situation is going to change. So it's an opportunity to be having them as a relationship. But if their comp situation gets more complex, then it will step up to the say, actually, I think it's probably time that you come and speak to a, a first wealth financial planner or we can arrange a conversation to see if we can help you. So that's exactly right. But yeah, I think, you know, my dream has always been to sort of have what I will call evidence-based financial planning. So all the financial planning is based on an algorithm that says this is the probability of success if you do this. So at the moment, if I if a client came into First Wealth and to 50 other IFAs in the country, the advice would, if it was reasonably complex, they could get 50 different outcomes, right? That's mm -hmm. the reality. Now, none of them could be wrong. They might be different. They might all be right. Um, probably the reality some would be wrong and some would be better but that's a different conversation but yeah. if it's about something like retirement planning actually there is a probability of what the best success is there you know so what I mean by that is if a client's 45 they're going to probably live to you know, maybe 88 based on their postcode and their health so we can tell them that 
We can tell them what their fund's going to be worth at 65. We can tell them based on long-term equity returns, whether they'd be better off in an annuity rate or if, whether they'd be in a drawdown and what that sustainable level of draw. That is all that data exists. So we should be able to put something in problem and say, this is the biggest chance of your meeting your financial planning goals based on probability, not on a, oh, what day is it? What day is it? Say Tuesday. Oh, is the leaves, sun's out today. Right, let's do drawdown. You know, that, I mean, I sort of jokingly say that, but that, you know, that, that's what I mean. It, it, it can't be on the subject, can, it can't be a subjective outcome. And financial appliances, have, they have biases as well, you know, whether it's about equity bias or loss aversion or endowment or framing of what So can we remove those biases and put probability at the answer of, of these answers? So, you know, we're, we're nowhere near that stage at the minute, but that's, that's, where, I, that's where I would like to get to with the technology we're, we're building um, so that everyone gets the best financial model opportunities to be successful. Cool. No, that sounds really, really um, positive. And yeah, hope, hopefully you get, get some traction with it. How, how's it been building software? Because that must be different to your day-to-day -day job. Yeah, it is. Um, so I just sort of come up with the ideas uh, and probably drive everyone nuts. That's my job, really. Uh, <laughs> and try to get everyone to do things about seven times quicker than it's possible to do them. That's, that's it. So I work with uh, Charlton and Elliot, who are the sort of co-founders of the open advice business, uh, Rob right. as well. So there's four of us. Um, they do all the coding. They've come from different backgrounds around building businesses and writing code and entrepreneurial. Uh, they've got their own businesses as well. So that's been cool. So really it's kind of what's the vision, build the advice flow, and then they bring it to life. And we've got another lad, Gareth, who's helping us to do some of the kit and stuff as well. So it's very different. Um, you know, I I don't profess to knowing the ins and out of coding and how it all works. I, to be honest, I don't need to know as long as the uh, Elliot and Charlton are all over it, really. So they they get it. Um, so they will then discuss the best way of bringing to life the ideas. But uh, yeah, and then my job really is, is around, I think it's probably the sort of the the finance side of it so getting it to where we are at the minute we're looking to raise finance so we're in conversation with a couple of uh, sort of eis providers to say that we need some next round of money to get to this next stage so hopefully we can get some cdis and eis funding um, from investors to give us an 18 month runway to then employ a couple of extra developers to really get us to the next stage of of, of the evolution of the product so yeah so it's all it's all going on um but yeah you know so everything, Matt, it's, it's different. It's, uh, you le I'm learning new skills. I'm working with people who are, you know, very different from the, maybe the financial planners I work with. So I, 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 I enjoy it. I think we can always learn more and learn from different people. Can't we? Yeah, no, no, but look, I, I, yeah, I've, I've developed some software over the, over my, over the years and it's, it's, it's a slow process and it's an, a frustrating process, but it can be rewarding if you, if you get it right. So yeah, good luck Correct. with that one. Thank you very much. Cool. And, and and in terms of some of the negative things that have happened over the years, what do you think has been your biggest failure or loss to date that you've 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 seen and and what did you learn from this? Um I think if I look back, um I'd say that the biggest criticism of myself, um I probably think I could have been more, I'm quite a risk taker, but I think I could put, we could have gone harder and taken more risk. Um, I think as we've grown, uh, we, I've always been quite keen to build up a really solid balance sheet at First Wealth. I don't like cash flow risk. I don't need that hassle. I need to be able to go to sleep at night knowing that our payroll sorted and everything else is, is going to be okay. So, you know, we've built up a steady, sensible cash flow balance sheet. Um, could we have pushed pushed the foot down a bit harder over the last four or five years and said, look, we're gonna try to go harder at this, take more people and you know, be not quite as cautious, possibly. Um, but I guess a lot of that's with hindsight. Um, and that said, when COVID came, I was very happy with the fact we'd been quite conservative. So we didn't have, we had no one on furlough. We had no redundancy. So we steered the ship through it really nicely. Um, so, yeah, maybe we've been a little bit conservative, but part of me thinks as a financial planning business, we almost have a duty to, to sort of practice what we preach. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure we should be a, a fly sort of fly by the seat of our pants type of business. It just doesn't really fit with, with a sort of sensible financial planning business. 
and, and co- mentioning COVID there again, how was that in terms of was your business versatile and adaptable at that point in time, or was it was it difficult to you know get keep keep things afloat? No, it was actually all right. We um, mm. all of the team had the software, so we were you know everyone had laptops. Um, everyone could set up remote work. We had we had Microsoft Teams installed in the business, um, so that was all good. So everyone could go to remote working pretty much straight away without without any drama. Um, it was we were in it was actually okay um yeah it, it was fine and the team stepped up they worked hard um you know work from home it went on you know it did go on a long time didn't it, it sort of felt like it was never going to end but no we i think we learned a lot from it um we just kept communicating well clients were brilliant really they all sort of switched to this sort of remote servicing which a lot of the clients preferred and actually continue to, to do that now um and we sort of we've kept a hybrid way of working. We now, we want the team in the office a couple of days a week, but we sort of work from home three days a week. So we've, we've kept that flexibility and that sort of suited people around their lives and what they're, they're doing outside of work as well. So I think we've sort of, I think we got through it pretty well um, and we learned a lot along the way. But yeah, from a cash flow perspective, we were, we were kind of okay. It was a little bit hectic, you know, the initial month or so of COVID because I think just like any business, it's like, well, what the hell's happening here? Because no one had seen a, a global pandemic before um but it, it we've you know it's everything you've just got to keep telling yourself the truth we've seen it all before this is a slight different variation of a theme everything will be okay don't panic get onto your clients tell them the same and it'll be all right and it and it and it was um so yeah we again it's the the wisdom of being around and seeing the financial crisis and seeing some of these other drawdowns go right we've been here before it's gonna be all right um just Take a deep breath and everything will be fine. <laughs> Absolutely. Wise advice there. And, yeah. and I, th- I think you also at that time made a bit of a transition in terms of, didn't you move move slightly out of London as well? So yeah, you, so you we, we we were quite lucky in a way. When we we moved out of London in 2017, so... Yeah. Uh, so we were ahead of the, you know, we were ahead of COVID by a couple of years. And um, just really, Matt, really on, you know, our daughter's seven, so she was two... Uh, I grew up in Dorset. Petra grew up in Brighton. It was like, right, well, let's go and move, live down by the sea. Um, so we moved to Dorset. Um, and obviously then with what happened with COVID, we, we were very fortunate in terms of living down here near the beach and being able to go out and go for a run or a cycle ride. So it was, it was relatively straightforward for us. So yeah, we, we had that change. And it was, it was really for the same reasons we talked to our clients about what are the things that are important to us as a family? What are the things that we value? Fam- family time you know, nature, fresh air. And for us, actually being able to go for a walk on the beach was way more important than being able to go to a, a museum or a posh restaurant. That for us is just, it's great and everyone's different, but mm. what makes us tick, those simple pleasures of, you know, just going for a wander in a field and having a pint on the way home, that that for me is is gold. Um, so yeah, we made a good decision. We've not looked back and I, I sort of travel up to London a couple of days a week now to see see the team and uh, do one or two days down here with the the tech guys as well so i you know get out of the house enough but it's a good it's a good balance yeah and i think that's definitely one of the things that covid has implemented across the board really is that kind of expectation of a work life balance whereas you know back in the day the expectation was you know if you're you know in your position as a as a chief exec, you know, you've got to kind of lead by example. And therefore, you know, if you're not leading by example, then the expectation would be that other people wouldn't be. But I think, yeah, the, it, it it seems to have adapted, which I think is a positive thing. Yeah, and that's right. And, you know, one of the things we've tried to do is, you're right, it'd be lead by example in a different way. So lead by example mm. to, by saying, look, if you follow me on Strava, you'll see that this afternoon I went out for my bike for an hour, you know, at lunchtime, because that's what I want to do. So I've said to all the team, look, I'm not going to try to hide any. This is what I do. Mm. I will get my work done, right? That's the reality. So, you know, I'm someone who would be quite happy to get up at six o'clock and work and do my work in the morning and then finish at four o'clock when Lux comes home. That, that's fine. You do what you want. As long as we, mm. as long as the clients get looked after and the work gets done, then there isn't one rule for me and one rule for everyone else. We're all in this together. Um, and it's, yes, yeah, certain. you just got to get the balance right. It's, you know, everyone has a life outside of work. So as long as you're getting your work done, do what you want. And I think the, the the difficult things occasionally are when maybe it goes too far the other way where people almost forget 
that they actually have to work as well and that's sometimes the challenge it's kind of you do have some things that we need to do here so it's just making sure that that transition back to a balance is is acceptable and sensible and you know most of the team our team has been amazing they've they've, they've worked it out pretty well so um but I, I i definitely get the conversations with some business owners that it's not it's some people have struggled with the transition back into some sort of normality and i still i still think a lot of firms and individuals haven't quite worked it out yet no i agree i think well i think that's not going to be something that gets resolved overnight either it's a no. kind of long, longer term thing yeah and, and and i think there's nothing wrong with that longer term i think it's it, i think by rushing back into things um well you've seen haven't you you've seen the issues that people at apple have had tim cooks right all the guys at apple are going to be back in the office everyone's upset and you see what's going on with twitter and elon musk everyone's going to be going <laughs> so i think i think you need to show a degree of empathy and compassion with it people have been used to working from home and how that is we want people to have a balance back we're not saying come back to the office five days a week but there's got to be a balance here that says this is good for you and it's good for the business and it's good for your mental health as well to actually be around your teammates and not in the not in the not at home all the time so but trying to get a quick switch either way i just think is wrong it's like let's just take a bit of time here and let's transition this over two or three years and get this right rather than make snap decisions and get everyone upset or something that doesn't work so i think you know we're 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 working out but you're right take 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 your time is is the right way to do this i think absolutely and you've touched upon the kind of exercise things and your your routine a little bit in terms of out out on the bike and i saw recently that you'd posted that you just signed up for an iron man and that's not the first one either are you mad well yeah no (laughs) no i mean i sort of got into um i did i sort of just got into triathlons again during lockdown i did some when i was younger I just needed something to be, get me out of the house and mm. I, I'm quite competitive. So I could have gone and cycled and run and stuff. But if I have an event, it just means I'm training, training for it. So yeah, I did, um, we're doing half try half Ironman sort of 70.3. So I did my first one right. this, this year. And then I've got one in Mallorca with a couple of mates in uh, May next year. So yeah, I train, I try to do train twice a day now. So uh, train in the morning. So I'll go swimming at six uh, or go on Zwift at six and then get that done, have breakfast, start work. And then I leave myself an hour and a half between 12 and 12, 30 and two to either go for a run or go to the gym or do something. I'm not every day, but probably four or five days a week, I'll do a double train. Um, try to take one day a week off, which is often the days I'm in London. So it's, it's quite full on. Um, but it makes you feel good. Uh, it takes your mind off work. Uh, I think mentally it has benefits. And I, it also helps me with things like not drinking very much because I can't get out of bed if I've had a couple of beers at six o'clock. So it helps me. I still like a beer certainly on a Friday or Saturday night, but what it gets away from is the glass of wine on a Monday or Tuesday night when you think, oh, I've got to get up at six, I can't handle it. So it just gets you in bed. It gets you sleeping. You enjoy the beers when they come. Um, and, you know, keep the weight off um but yeah i love it i really got into it and i've got a really good community down here of a cycle club who are keen to cycle and go for a few beers on a thursday night and uh and you know just and quite a few runners as well so there's always people to engage with locally and it's down i think there's quite a big community down here everyone seems to know everyone so no it's really good i i really love it and uh yeah really it definitely helps with with the with work and removing stress or just keeping everything in check i think yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. I think it's important. Um, and is there anything else that helps you to focus or is 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 that your kind of methodology, your time to switch off and detach? Um, it's my it's my main one. Um, the exercise, as I was saying earlier on, I'm, I'm learning how to DJ at the moment. So that's something that I'm quite into. I've, I've always liked the idea of I love music. Um, so I'm learning, yeah, I've got my decks here, which is cool. So I had some lessons a few months ago. So I'm sort of playing with that now. So trying to learn how to put everything together. Again, it's quite a nice switch off, just be able to, you know, get to eight o'clock. A lot of it's around optimizing your time. So I was going to say, trying to avoid too much television. That said, the World Cup's on at the moment. So I'll be glued to my screen probably tonight, just like any, I love sport. That's my problem. Um, so any football match that's on or rugby or anything I'll watch. But in the evenings, rather than sitting down and like what's on Netflix, trying to find stuff for the sake of it. Um, let's play some music. Um, let's read a book. Let's try to, let's try to, I call it optimize every minute. I know that sounds a bit full on, but it's, it's just trying to avoid 
dead time and doing stuff that's 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 a bit dull so yeah you know family work stuff health a uh, bit of downtime bit of music um just trying to mix it up really I, I just like having things to do that aren't just work i just trying to learn new skills and get better at things other than just 100 mile an hour at work because it's you know work i love what i do but it's there's there's bit there's a bigger life outside of it really absolutely absolutely and in terms of people that inspire you is there anyone in particular that you you kind of you know whenever you see them speak or talk or whatever they do is there anyone that you you kind of yeah you know you look up to um i mean elon musk is just an interesting character because i just i'm not sure if i I don't know if I'd admire him because of the way he is, but I, I think there's a certain awe about him that it's just, it's, it's, we are living with a genius on, at the moment that I think time, I think sometimes when you're living through something, it's kind of, you don't really gauge them in the same way, but I think history will look back on what he's doing at the moment of, of probably one of the most influential people that ever have walked this planet. So mm. I think, you've got to keep an eye on what they're up to and what they're, what they're doing. Um, because it's pretty mind boggling really what they're, what they're, what he, what, how he thinks about the world and how, how he does things. Um, but yeah, listen, I listen to, I read a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not an avid, um, follower of people. I sort of, I think there's an element of make your own way. And I, I, I just, one thing I sort of sometimes not, not sort of criticized but i think sometimes everyone is everyone's on the latest podcast or everyone's on the latest book and it's like you've got to do this you've got to do this. everyone's saying the same thing and it's like actually there's quite a lot of merit for just standing back and go what, what do i think what, what do i think about the world and how do i think we should do things um rather than just spouting the same nonsense or the same ideas that everyone else has got you know they, and a lot there's a lot of amazing stuff out there but you you need to encourage yourself and your brain to think about problems themselves um and i think just lo reading other people's solutions maybe doesn't necessarily do that maybe just a just an observation no no i agree well and and i think there's something to be said for if everyone else is going in one direction go the other way right as yeah, well the kind I, of contrarian I, 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 approach yeah a contrarian approach and um I just, yeah, it's like everything. I think it's like all these things. If you want something enough, you'll do it. You'll make it happen. You'll find a way. Um, and I think that we've always uh, quite like that. Find a way to do stuff. I mean, it's, and that's probably what we were saying earlier on. It's like, right, why do you push yourself? Why are we trying to do all these businesses? Why are you trying to do all these triathlons? It's like, because they're doable and you're pushing yourself, right? It's like, what are the, what are the limits? What am I capable of? And it's like with everything, it's like, well, you find your barriers and your boundaries and, Oh, actually that was all right um so you can then push a bit further um mm. it's you know like when we moved down to dorset in well when we set up the business in 2008 or 2009 after the final, everyone's like you're crazy you're crazy to do this I was like yeah maybe when i when i quit my job at chase to to go traveling the world everyone's like you're a crazy guy and then when we moved to dorset it's like oh my god you're crazy to move out of london so actually and all those things like crazy 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 and go all of those were some of the best decisions i've ever made and everyone was telling me i'm a crazy guy for doing it so <laughs> the next time someone tells me i'm crazy then right i'm going to jump in headlong and say if you think that's crazy it's probably a really good idea so let's do it um <laughs> but i think too many people just get they listen to other people and they don't make those big decisions and you know, maybe they'll regret that or maybe they won't but i just think if you back yourself and you do do what's what feels right then more often than not it will be it will be the right thing for you to do wise words um and and in terms for uh younger younger listeners and viewers um who are you know starting out in their in their entrepreneurial journeys have you got any advice or tips that you would give them um i guess be clear about what you're trying to achieve and the reasons behind it you know what your target market is and your audience and what you people around you is, is important um and I think the thing I've learned and what we've tried to do at Open Advice is to beg, borrow and steal. So rather than just throw money at it, um, it's good to sort of write what conversation, who can I get to help me here and who, how can I leverage a connection or who could who could help me with this? So try to keep your cost base down. And I think one of the things I look at, some of these tech businesses that you look at, you look at what they built and you look at what they spent and you think that is mind boggling, the amount of money you've burned through to get to where you have. And it's because I think they've got the money. It just goes I'm like, well, I've got, I've got a funding round of five or 10 million quid, right? It's going out all over the place. And it's like, well, we've run out of money. Let's get some more. Whereas if you haven't got any money, <laughs> 
you're right. How, how am I going to do this? Um, right. How can I leverage my network or who could help me with this? Or is there a way I can talk to someone or network it out? And so I think use your network uh, and avoid, you know, spending any money you don't need to is really good advice until you've certainly got to the point where you've got a product that's demonstrable and showing value and got some revenue. I, th I think probably that's my, 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 what I've learned um, so far on, on doing the tech stuff. Absolutely. And obviously, if you are looking to raise capital in a company as well, then if you can get it to that next level up, then, you know, you're going to give less away because you can be able to attract investors at a higher valuation, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things I'm you know, really proud about what we've done at Open Advice. We funded it ourselves through First Wealth. We spent, you know, spent some money on it, but certainly a, a minuscule amount of some of the mind boggling amounts I, I hear. And I think we've got a product already, you know, that's 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 as good as that's pretty much as good as some of the other stuff that I've seen out there already. And I, mean, I don't think we've started yet. So I think we, I'm really, you know, we've done well. Um, we've, we've leveraged the network. We've, 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 we've sort of used our skills as we've got them to get to first base. We do need to get that going a bit faster. So we will need to take, to take revenue, but yeah, at the moment it's all self-funded. We built it all off our own back and our own IP. So yeah, that's that, you know, pretty, you know, I think that's great. I'm proud of that. Yeah, well, con congratulations. Well, that's the questions that I had for you, and I appreciate you've got a busy day. So, yeah, thank you, thank you for taking the time out to to join us on the Growth Show. Um, just over to you for any closing remarks, and also where we can find you um, in terms of the various business ad website addresses, and and from a personal perspective as well. Yeah, definitely. So, firstwealth.co.uk is the financial planning business. Uh, openadvice.co.uk. Uh, is the uh, tech bit and then thrive money hq uh, .co .uk is the thrive money website but if you search for thrive money hq on instagram then there's an instagram page there which will show you what we're what we're doing as well um, the best way to find me is really on linkedin i think that's probably the social channel i hang out on most uh, just google or sort of search my name um and then you'll see what i'm talking about and thinking about on there and please connect with me i'm very happy to have a conversation with anyone awesome well thank you for your time and a really interesting insight to the life of a uh, chief executive of a wealth management company so thank you for your time anthony thanks matt very much i really enjoyed it thank you thanks for listening to the growth show with matt Lindsay. please like our podcast and subscribe today